talking about Nietzsche's view of knowledge and truth and uh, seeing how uh, he takes the pluralism uh, between different viewpoints to be uh, simply uh, an extension of various um, underlying emotional uh, tendencies, ultimately reducible to the will to power in varying degrees. And uh, that it's this Nietzschean approach which is one of the major influences uh, shaping the contemporary postmodernism, um, and for that matter, the pluralism uh, of our day. And uh, as we um, were trying to get some acquaintance with phenomenology, and particularly Husserl, uh, we were noting that uh, uh, his concern is precisely this lack of any firm foundation uh, for the sciences, mathematics, logic, any other kind of human knowledge. And uh, he blames this on naturalism, a naturalistic philosophy, with its attempt to explain human knowledge in purely, terms of purely natural processes. So you get historical explanations, you get psychological explanations. Uh, he talks there of historicism and psychologism. And of course Nietzsche would be a prime example of psychologism, uh, a psychological explanation of the knowledge claims which people make. Uh, one of the other um, tendencies of his day, which he is criticizing, uh, is the work of a neo-Kantian philosopher who we mentioned back then, I think, Wilhelm Dilthey, uh, who um, was interested in philosophical worldviews and um, classified worldviews into three sorts, each of which he attributed to some aspect of uh, human psychology. So that you get, if you like, the, um, uh, the, the rational mind, you get the, uh, the value-oriented mind, you get the empirically concerned individual, in fact, the three things that Jaspers was trying to pull together in terms of uh, what constitutes the whole of authentic human existence. Well, uh, what um, Husserl does is to see in this another kind of naturalistic explanation, in which while he's grounding worldviews in the human spirit, it's really in the human spirit understood simply in terms of certain psychological types, and how you're going to overcome the relativism if that's the case. In other words, what um, Husserl is after is not just a new foundations of new foundationalism, but a universal foundation. Something that isn't just an account of differences because of different psychological types, as in Nietzsche and Dilthey, uh, but rather is something about the universal structure of the human self, uh, by virtue of which there is a universal foundation. That's what he's after. Now, uh, one of the um, complaints that he has in the same context is that uh, the subject-object dichotomy which has dominated thought since um, Descartes, uh, asking for an isolation of the object from all subjective influences in our thinking. That subject-object dichotomy is, uh, is really very artificial. Uh, after all, if you are saying, uh, I know something, you're hardly getting at what knowledge is if you just represent the object. The I know is an act of the subject. And it is the loss of that uh, human subjecthood, the loss of a, an adequate understanding of the human spirit, uh, which is what ails the naturalistic philosophy, and what therefore underlies the failure of naturalism. So what um, Husserl wants then is, if you like, and this is what he calls it, a science of the human spirit, or a science of the human consciousness, a science of the I. Now, um, that of course is the sort of thing that Descartes attempted. At least that's where Descartes started. But um, while Husserl goes back to Descartes, back that is to the beginning of universal doubt out of which the cogito emerges, I think, for Husserl's purposes, Descartes was not nearly radical enough in his suspended judgment. Uh, he suspended judgment on everything that could possibly be doubted, uh, but immediately jumped from the I think to the assertion that he's a thinking thing. And with that very brief nod of recognition, he leaves the human subject altogether, and has really not examined what is universal about human consciousness, the I, in the I know. Um, on the other hand, Immanuel Kant, in asking what is it which uh, orders and unifies our experience, our knowledge, the whole range of human consciousness, it comes up with the transcendental self and talks of a synthetic unity of that perception, you recall. Uh, now that, um, Husserl seems to find more um, the direction he wants to go. What Kant called the transcendental ego, the transcendental self, the transcendental self. Uh, Kant, in the rational psychology section of the Critique of Pure Reason, uh, discusses, you remember, you read it, you outlined it, um, discusses some of um, Descartes' um, attempts to get at the I, the self. And, um, uh, decided that those metaphysical speculations simply did not have adequate grounds. Husserl is not discouraged by Descartes' failure. Uh, what Husserl attempts to do then is to go back to the Descartes foundations and see if he cannot, from that starting point, elicit uh, something of the universal structure of the transcendental layer. So uh, that um, brings us down to the need for a more radical uh, starting point. Um, I, I might mention that uh, when he was asked to lecture at the Sorbonne, uh, where everybody has to pay homage to Descartes. I mean, he's the patron philosopher, patron saint of French philosophy. Um, what um, he did was to present lectures known as the Cartesian Meditations. Cartesian Meditations. Um, starting with Descartes literally and trying to describe his methodology in relationship to Descartes. Well, um, what he um, does do then is to talk about um, two aspects of um, the phenomenological method uh, that he wants. First of all, bracketing, which is simply suspending judgment. The sort of thing Descartes did, 
about all objects of thought and objects of perception. Um, he uses the term epoche at times. Uh, that's the term that the Greek skeptics used for suspended judgment. So bracketing, suspense of judgment, epoche. Um, Descartes did it with whatever could be doubted as part of his methodology. Um, Husserl isn't doubting the existence of objects when he writes them. Uh, he never questions their existence. His concern is uh, why we do not have a more well-grounded knowledge of their very essence. That's his concern, the foundations of knowledge. So in bracketing objects of knowledge, he's bracketing variables between particular bits of knowledge, particular kinds of knowledge. In fact, um, he emphasizes consciousness sometimes much more than knowledge and brackets all the objects of consciousness. Consciousness of all sorts, not just um, um, consciousness of some clearly articulated uh, understanding. All states of consciousness. And he tries to get at that um, universal structure of consciousness. All particulars, all theories, all interpretations are bracketed. I, I might add that uh, at the beginning of his work, he tried to maintain a purely theoretical attitude. Uh, that is to say, not involving any practical dimensions of human existence like the pragmatists do in talking of human knowledge. But in the later stages of his work, he talked of even bracketing that theoretical attitude, which is an artificial sort of thing. Uh, recognizing that uh, when I say I know something, you see, uh, what I'm knowing is something as part of my overall world view, the overall way in which I live. Um, what I know, how I know, is ingredient to my Lebenswelt, my lived world. And what he wants to do is to get at the eye of the lived world rather than the eye of some abstruse theoretical knowledge of the world. Uh, so the I know of pre-scientific consciousness, the I know of a pre-theoretical consciousness. That is to say, the I know of ordinary life. That's what he wants to get at. Now, that latter move of his um, led to the attempt of students of his to uh, do a phenomenological description, not just of the I know, but of the entire activity of the I in the life world. And that's the sort of thing you find in the existential phenomenologists like Heidegger. So you can see that they grew out of Husserl at precisely that point of bracketing the theoretical scientific attitude and trying to get at the, uh, the I who is there within the world uh, in a pre-theoretical, non-theoretical basis. Put that another way. Come back to this um, subject-object dichotomy. The naturalist ignores subjectivity in um, a Husserl sense and focuses simply on the object, giving objective scientific accounts of how that knowledge is possible. Um, it would be a mistake, on the other hand, to bracket out the object and just concentrate on the subject in some sort of introspective fashion. Because there is in the life world, there is in reality, no such thing as the I that I know without an object of knowledge. So what you're trying to study really is not the subject, not the object, in the sense that Descartes said, that's a thinking thing, that's an extended thing. No, what you're trying to study is the hyphen. Yeah, what is the relationship between these two by virtue of which we have knowledge? Because the I know something, know is the hyphen, you see. So what is that universal structure of consciousness of which knowledge is a phenomenon? You see, that's the question. Um, well, that, that same sort of thing becomes evident in the existentialists when uh, Heidegger says uh, that uh, our existence, design, literally being there, you see, it's not a private, isolated being, my being. It's a being there, in the world, you see. Um, and the, uh, the same is true in Sartre's um, well-known um, statement that we are um, um, cast into a world not of our own making. Uh, there's a being in the world. That's the very nature of human existence, that inness, being in the world. So um, the mistake then of Descartes was not only that he was not radical enough in his doubt, in his bracketing, didn't go back far enough, but it was also that he conceived of the eye as a separated eye. That is to say, I'm an eye whether or not there's a world. You see? And he didn't know there was a real world until meditation six. All that time, for all that time, he may be working just, just an eye. Well, meditation three, it's I and God. You see? But he really has no basis for arguing other finite selves until meditation six, and you've got a body. And hence some um, analogous reading in terms of my mind-body relationship and yours. Well, that's a very artificial kind of role. And what Husserl is, is after is an understanding of the I as it is concretely. The theoretical attitude of Descartes has to be bracketed. You cannot abstract the I from its concrete relationships. Um, well then, what are we going to say about the hyphen? A little thing like a hyphen. And the main thing that um, uh, Husserl uh, emphasizes, and this uh, is often regarded as his great discovery, the one thing is the intentionality of consciousness. The intentionality of consciousness. Now, keep in mind the term intentionality as it was used in the late medievals. It has to do with the conscious external reference which the mind has in knowing something. Perception, knowledge, other states of consciousness are teleological acts. Acts oriented towards an object. Now, Descartes uses the image of consciousness as simply entertaining ideas within the mind. 
And that representational view leaves wide open whether there are any objects the ideas are about. Whereas what Husserl is saying is one of the universal features, part of the very essence of human consciousness, is that it's always consciousness of. Consciousness of, an idea of, knowing that. It's always reference to it. It's directional. And that's true even in memory. You're referring back. Anticipation. Referring on to the future. The thinking of some absent member of the class. A reference to him. There's always that. Sometimes it's a reflexive act. Thinking on that thought, you see. But uh, this is the very nature of the act of consciousness. It's not a passive sort of thing, the way Locke pictured receiving ideas. Passively. Tabula rasa. But it's an active sort of thing. And this is his debt to Kant. You see. Uh, Kant introduced the notion of the, the self, the conscious self, as an active kind of knower uh, that actually contributes to experience forms that unify it temporarily, spatially, and then categories that unify the understanding beyond the experience. Now, this is what um, Husserl then is um, referring to, that act of consciousness that does something. What does it do? And the, um, the language that is used here for describing what intentionality does um, ranges uh, various things. Uh, first, it um, makes the object present to me. Yeah. The object does not present itself to me passively opening the door. You see? Uh, but I, by, as it were, giving attention to, get the reference there, by giving attention to something, um, putting my mind to it. You see what I'm saying? Putting my mind to, giving attention, looking at. What I do is to make the object present to me. I bring the object in. Um, this is sometimes said as um, a constitutive act. Yes, because in the act of knowing, I constitute the object an object, an object of knowing. In terms of the subject-object relationship, there's no object without a subject. How can it be an object if it's not an object without a subject? Any more than there isn't a subject without an object. How can it be a subject if it's not a subject that has an object? Yes, and so um, what it does is to constitute the object, the object for me that it is. You see? And that's almost coming. In the act of knowing, the thing in itself becomes a thing for me. In knowing, I constitute it a thing for me. You see? Well, in addition to constitutive, it is a constructive act. Um, just as for Kant, it is the, uh, the time form that schematizes the understanding. So the very nature of my knowing, you see, constructs, constructs the, the overall situation, pulls it together for me. It's not just the isolated object, uh, but the whole scene that is interrelated for me. Uh, all knowledge is, in that sense, uh, self-referential. Uh, it's like, uh, here I stand, I can, do, I can see no other. Because from where I stand, I see it all in these relationships, in relationship to me, the other. Whereas from your perspective, it might be different, but it's constructive. Um, but the same token, um, it is a meaning-giving act. It's a meaning-giving act. Um, it's not so much Husserl who uses this phrase, I think, but some of the later writers. The um, underlying assumption here is that uh, whatever else the act of knowing does, in seeing it as the object for me, I give it meaning for me. And in that sense, I give it meaning. Um, the um, confusing thing is that um, intentionality, with its uh, referentiality, uh, is itself sometimes called the act of meaning simply because our word meaning is ambiguous. You see, if I mean something, what do I mean when I say, it's you I mean, but it's you I'm referring to, it's you I intend in what I'm saying. So one sense of meaning has to do with referentiality, intentionality. The other sense of meaning is, uh, yeah, more the existential thing, of giving meaning to something that's meaningless, or giving it to it a certain meaning that it's going to have for me. So uh, in the more existential phenomenology, you find that notion of the, the meaning giving. Um, in any case, it's the notion of ordering the objects, ordering the world. Um, yeah, consciousness is not passive, but active. Um, consciousness is not representational, carrying mental pictures of what's out there. It's not representational, it's constitutive. The idea, the ideas that I have about something constitute it as that for me. You see, it's not just representational, copy theory. So um, intentionality then is the, is the key to the whole thing. Um, if, um, uh, if you read much about uh,